Convicted perjurer and serial liar Michael Cohen is back on the stand. We've already seen him lie on the other stands that he's been on, and now he is in the Trump trial. Day 16, we're going to go into the excerpts courtesy of Matthew Russell Lee at Inner City Press reporting and see exactly what happened because it was a full day of direct testimony, meaning no cross-examinations from Michael Cohen yet. We'll see if we get to that in day 17, 18, or 19. But here is Trump before the day starts. Let's get our bearing straight, see who else is joining him in the courtroom. Coming out in Manhattan, you see Todd Blanche. Donald Trump's got some stripes on the tie today. We see Alina Abba's in the background. I do believe that is Eric Trump back there. We saw J.D. Vance is hanging out as well, much. right we here. appreciate you being here. The New York Times just came out with a poll that shows us leading everywhere by a lot. This is the cover story, and I think you'll find it very interesting, but I'm sure you've all read it. Leading in Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania, Arizona, Michigan, Georgia, and Nevada. Nevada, we are leading actually by 12 points. Yeah, which is yeah. generally a Democrat state. I think we're probably leading in New Jersey. We had a rally over 100,000 people this weekend. A lot of the mainstream media didn't want to say how many people they didn't want to cover. Uh, we talked about it. In fact, I don't think anybody did. I hear the crowd was not shown by the mainstream media, which is what they tell me, but that's part for the course. A couple of quotes that just came out. Fareed Zakari, a no friend of mine. The Trump trial is politically motivated. I doubt the New York indictment would have been brought against a defendant whose name was not Donald Trump. That's true. Mark Levin, great guy, brilliant man. Our judicial system has blown up. It's broken. Andrew McCarthy, Trump should be acquitted in Manhattan. Wholly independent of the plethora of constitutional infirmities in the prosecution, it should be thrown out for the most basic of reasons. Brad cannot prove his case. Got no evidence. And I'm innocent. This is a political witch hunt. That's right. And nobody's ever seen anything like it. And it's, I tell you what, the appellate division on the judges should step in because what this judge is getting away with is disgraceful. Including the fact that we have thousands of people, we have 100,000 people in New Jersey. They would like to show their support. It's like an armed camp outside. You can't get one person within three blocks of this courthouse. Greg Jarrett, we're not, I mean, you take a look at this statement. It's, we're entering the fourth week. And there's still no evidence whatsoever connecting Trump with any criminal wrongdoing. A crime that's not charged, it's a crime that in which prosecutors won't even tell the defendant what it is. I have no idea what they're even doing. We don't know. We still don't know. We have Fourth records, week. records, and they talk about bookkeeping. The only thing down in the bookkeeping is that we call a legal expense a legal expense. We don't call it a construction expense. We don't say for concrete legal. work. Legal. We don't say for electrical legal work. Expense. We pay the lawyer a legal expense, and we have a legal expense is a legal expense. It's marked down in the book, quote, legal expense. Legally. Marked down. All right. So that is what we marked down. We know where this is going to go because Michael Cohen is on the stand and let's jump into inner city press reporting. Trial starts day 16. Trump is here. Dark blue suit, light blue tie. We saw him talking to his lawyer, Emil Bove to his left. Todd Blanche to his right, lead counsel seat. We're wondering if Todd Blanche will be cross-examining Michael Cohen. Todd Blanche is whispering to Trump. He's covering his mouth like a baseball manager talking to a pitcher on the mound. He doesn't want anyone else to read his lips over there, those prosecutors. Then Todd Blanche leaned behind Trump to speak with Bove. He says, hey, we gonna kill it today? My man, let's go. Susan Nicholas is sitting at the far end of the defense table, also separated by Bove. They're ready to go. It's Cohen time. All rise. Judge pops into the courtroom. Please be seated. Clerk announces to the courtroom, this is the time set for the people of the state of New York versus Donald Trump. Appearances, please. Parties announce. Judge Mercon comes and says, good morning, everybody. Welcome back. Hope you had a nice weekend. Happy Mother's Day. Now, I received the government's proposed jury charges. I haven't had a time to review them yet. I've also reviewed the separation agreement of Alan Weisselberg, the CFO who's currently in jail, and I am not going to allow it in, says the judge. So not going to allow that in. Prosecutor says, what? Huh? Bring in the jury. Jury comes in. All rise. We're there. Hey, jurors. Good to see you. Come on back. Nice to see you. Jury is seated again. We're ready to go. Judge Mercon, government. Next witness, please. Prosecutor comes up, stands up. It's says, Your Honor, the government calls Michael Cohen. Michael Cohen walks into the courtroom, sort of waddles, you know how he is. He puts his hand up, raise your right hand. Mr. Cohen, you promise to tell the truth, tell the truth, not the truth, I've got? Yes, ma'am, I do. Prosecutor says, can you tell me your full name, sir, and your age? He says, yes, Michael Dean Cohen, age 57. Mr. Cohen, tell me about yourself. Tell the jury about yourself, a little bit about yourself. Sure, I'd love to. He says, well, I grew up on Long Island. My father taught surgery, met my mom, and, you know, four children later, 
here I am. And why did you want to be a lawyer, Mr. Cohen? Well, my grandmother really wanted it. I wanted to go to Wall Street, but I started in personal injury law at 225B Way. One of my clients allowed me to buy 50% of Manhattan maintenance taxi medallions. You were also in real estate, is that right? Well, I did, yeah. I started buying Trump properties, then I started buying buildings. I went to Philip Neiser, then I went to Trump Org. And Mr. Cohen, you work for Trump, right? Yeah. You'd recognize him, yeah. And you see Mr. Trump in court, just so we can identify him to be clear of something you have to do in criminal cases, make sure they're there. This is the criminal, he's right there. Do you see Mr. Trump in court? Yeah, right there. Blue suit, blue tie. And tell me how you met Mr. Trump. Originally through Don Jr., I handled a situation at Trump World Tower. I was asked to review documents about Trump Entertainment Resorts, and I did it. I came in there, we resolved it. And so what happened is I presented the $100,000 bill, and Mr. Trump said, whoa, do you want to work for me? And so I was just honored. I went over, and the bill to Phillips Neiser was never paid. So he sounds like he's working for another company. Trump says, I'll hire you. Cohen comes over here. Cohen presented them with the bill. He just says, how about you just come over here? And I just don't pay you. You just come over here or something. Government says, Mr. Cohen, what was your salary when you worked over for Trump? Well, we arrived at 375000 Nice. Bonuses were to be discussed. And he gave me Ivanka's over office on the 26th floor of Trump Tower. And so I was the executive vice president and I was special counsel to Donald Trump. And what matters did you handle, Mr. Cohen? Well, whatever he wanted. A New Jersey golf course. The funding was pulled by Governor Corzine. So it was a big problem. So I had to go over there and kind of fix that, talk to him and get the money back and whatever. So I worked on stuff like that. Did Mr. Trump ever ask you to renegotiate bills? He says, yeah. For example, I do it with law firms. Law firms, I know law building. I'm a lawyer. So I'd call them, try to negotiate the bills down, whatever. Did you do that with Trump University? Try to negotiate their bills? Yeah, I did. It fell into trouble. 50 vendors had not been paid. We had $2 million in the bank, but the bills were much higher. And so I got all but two vendors to accept 20% of what they were owed. And they signed and they got checks FedEx in 48 hours. What about the other two? Well, they just went away. Mr. Trump told me, fantastic, they're gone. I felt like I was on top of the world. It's wild that all of this is even coming in. It's, I guess it's relevant to business records. So they're saying he didn't pay people. So is this fraud or did they sue him? So they're just allowing it all, total free for all, whatever Cohen wants. While at the Trump org, did you threaten to sue people? He says, yeah, there was a Miss USA contestant defaming and we brought an arbitration against her and it was resolved. So she said some bad things. We brought an arb and with the press, I would reach out with their need to redact or take it down and we'd sue. So I'd basically, you know, send them a takedown notice or else. So you did a lot of business work, Mr. Cohen. Did you do any personal work for Mr. Trump? Yes. A yellow cab hit his limo one time. And so I walked up to the driver and I got him to pay. Also a bathroom overflow in his apartment. So I guess Cohen went up and plunged the toilet, I guess, which is, you know, probably a difficult task for him. Prosecutor, did you deal with the press? He says, yeah, I try to play stories and try to minimize the negatives as well. And when you were there, how often did you speak with Mr. Trump? Cohen says multiple times a day. And how would you communicate? Oh, either in person or by cell phone. That's it. I might call Rana Graff or Keith Schiller, his personal attache or his bodyguard. And Rana was an executive assistant, Hope Hicks, communications. Mr. Cohen, did Mr. Trump use email? No, he didn't. He didn't have an address. He told me, you know, too many people have gone down because of emails that prosecutors can use in a case. He's looking at the jurors like, yeah, just like this one. Where'd you meet Mr. Trump when you did speak with him? In his office. He had an open door policy. So I'd just come in when I needed to talk to him about something. Were you told to update him on matters? Yes. And if you didn't immediately tell him, it would not go over well for you. So you needed to tell him. Was he a micromanager, Mr. Cohen? Yes, ma'am. I think he was. Yeah. I called him boss. There were great times. For the most part, I enjoyed my work. And Mr. Cohen, did you ever lie for Trump? Yes, I did. I bullied people too. I did it because I wanted to make him happy. Did you get additional titles for your work? Yes, I was put on the board of Miss Universe and I was treasurer at some of the properties as well. Did some people call you his fixer, Mr. Cohen? Yes, that was accurate. I was. And did you use cell phones ending in 6886 and 0114? Yes. Do you still use the latter one? Yes. And did our office ask you for those two cell phones? Yes, you did. And I provided them to you in January 2023. Did you sync your contacts with his? Yes, the IP people did it. I had over 30,000 contacts in my phone and we synced them up. Did you know David Pecker, Mr. Cohen? Yes, I did. I knew him before I knew Mr. Trump. I met him on Long Island. Later, we spoke by Signal, the messaging app. Did you ever contact Mr. Pecker before 2015 when all of these things got underway? He started running for president? Yes, like when Mr. Trump gave money to Harlem for hoops. I did. I contacted Pecker. So you did that because why? You were trying to get a good story out? Yeah. And do you know Dylan Howard as well? Yeah, I do. He he worked for Mr. Pecker 
like I did for Mr. Trump. And Dylan Howard was the content manager at AMI, which owned the National Enquirer, which was so-called part of the catch and kill ordeal. Mr. Cohen, in 2011, was Mr. Trump exploring a run for president? He says, yes, he was. In fact, I saw a poll that 6% thought Mr. Trump should run for president. And so I created a website, shouldtrumprun.com. Many came to the website. Did he run in 2011? No, there was a season of The Apprentice coming up. Like he told me, you don't leave Hollywood, Hollywood leaves you. But he told me in 2011 that he would do it again next time. And guess what? He did. What was your role back during all this era? I was a surrogate. Did you make an appearance for his campaign? He says, I did. Yeah, I went on MSNBC, CNN. I'd provide comment. Watching the rallies, I noticed it was very white, says Cohen. So I started a group called the National Diversity Coalition for Trump. I formed it with Daryl Scott, an evangelical from Cleveland. And did you meet with Mr. Pecker and Mr. Trump? Yes, I did. We met about the power of the National Enquirer. With its space in grocery stores and bodegas, it was all over the place. Mr. Pecker said that he could keep an eye out for anything negative and he could help us try to stop it. Did the National Enquirer preview stories for you, Michael? Yeah, they did. For example, Hillary Clinton wearing thick glasses. Allegations that she had a brain injury. Are those allegations? Ted Cruz's father was with Oswald. We haven't proven that he's not the Zodiac Killer. And Marco Rubio in a pool with a bunch of other dudes. Oh, no. What did Trump say when he saw those? He said, that's fantastic. What's this, Mr. Cohen? They put this document up on the screen. It's an email with AMI in October 2015. You know, come back on these points. Is this any different than Hillary Clinton saying Trump got urinated on by Russian hookers? No, it's all ridiculous, right? But Trump is being prosecuted for this. Hillary is not being prosecuted for her Russian hooker story. What is this, Mr. Cohen? This is an email with AMI in October 2015. Somebody called Barry Levine said, we are repackaging positive material about Donald. I wrote back, yes, take out the part of the penthouse pet Sandra. And it was on January 6, 2016. The article ran, says Cohen, a week later. The Donald Trump, nobody knows. It was the name of the article. So I was involved in that. And how about that doorman story? Remember the doorman story? There was somebody called, I forget his name, who got paid some money. He said Trump, he was the doorman. He said Trump had some baby with a love mistress woman. Says, what about that story, Michael? Yeah, there was a story that there was a love child. I asked Mr. Trump what he wanted me to do. It involved two employees of the Trump org. And so we talked about the life rights to the story. And so AMI bought the story from the doorman. What were the terms? Well, they were $30,000 was one. So we're paying 30,000 for it. And it was also to not publish the story. We were also going to take it off the market so nobody else could see it. Did you tell them that Mr. Trump would be grateful if you did that? He says, absolutely. I reviewed the deal and helped get that done. Government says, we want to put up people's 165 into evidence. Now, this is an email from Dylan Howard, the content manager at National Enquirer about the addendum to the doorman story. And this, what is this, Cohen? He says, that's the addendum or what we call an amendment. Did you tell Mr. Trump about this deal? He says, yeah, I did. I wanted to get credit for it for him to know that I got it put in. So I told him and he said, that's great. Thanks for taking care of that for me, Mr. Cohen. Michael, in June of 2016, elections coming up. Did you become aware of Karen McDougal, who of course we know is droopy here? She is the former Playboy playmate with a long history on their covers, who then wanted to get on Dancing with the Stars, had a little bit of a breast implant problem. He says, yeah, from AMI, they told me about her, National Enquirer. And so I told Mr. Trump, I said, did you know Mr. Trump who Karen McDougal was? He said, yeah, she's really beautiful. Oh, he said, she's beautiful. Did that lead you to draw any conclusions? Objection! Sustained. Prosecutor continues. Now, Blanche is making the objections to Cohen's direct. It seems he and not Beauvais or Nicholas will be cross-examining Cohen. So it looks like Todd Blanche is ready to go. So Mr. Cohen, did you use Signal for these communications? He says, yeah, I did. Well, how come? Why did you use Signal? Well, we wanted our messages to stay private. And did you update Mr. Trump on all these exchanges? He says, yeah. Now, how about these texts? Can you tell us what's going on here? Cohen says, sure. This was Dylan. He wrote to me. Dylan said, I'm about to meet her, Karen McDougal. And what did they tell you after that? Well, they believe that they had it under control. So I'll get this locked down for you. I won't let it out of my grasp. I guess that's from AMI. Dylan wrote to me. We got this Karen McDougal thing under control. Cohen, don't worry about it. We'll handle it. Michael, did you witness talks between Mr. Trump and David Pecker from the National Enquirer? Did you see those two guys talk? He says, yeah, I was in his office. He used a speaker box. David Pecker said, we'll take care of this. So I got to hear everything. Were there costs discussed for this McDougal story? Yeah, he said $150,000 and Mr. Trump said, okay, I'll take care of it. And how about this? In that message, Dylan Howard told me that they rejected the offer. I implored my guy to get it done. I said, don't let her take it to ABC. Remember, she was going to go to ABC and is that where Dancing with the Stars was or whatever? She was tired of being a Playboy playmate. She wanted to, you know, make something of herself now. So she's going to go dance on the TV and helicopter those things 
things all over the place, I guess. But that didn't happen. Maybe because her story was crap and ABC's like, eh, we don't like it. But anyways, prosecutor fast forwards through all that. But AMI got the deal, didn't they? What was the deal? So they actually got it. They rejected your 150. They went to ABC. ABC said, ew, get out of here. You're gross. They went back to AMI. What was it? $150,000 as well as 24 penned articles in her name and two covers all over the National Enquirer. By the way, they're selling magazines. It's not like AMI is hurting. They're like, oh, okay. You have to write a bunch of articles about a playmate and her droopy boobies. Okay. It's going to sell a ton of magazines. Look what they did to McDougal's, you know, nipples. Wow. Everybody's like, whoa, okay. I guess I got to buy it. What happened to the nipples? So let's see. So 24 articles. She's going to be all over the covers. She's a nice looking woman. They sell a bunch of magazines anyway. Big deal. So they'll recoup that 150 and now they've got a story. So did Keith Davidson reach out to you? Keith Davidson is the lawyer for Stormy Daniels and McDougal. So to Cohen, hey, did Keith Davidson, their lawyer, reach out? Cohen says, yeah. I dealt with him in 2011 about Stormy Daniels and on the dirty.com, she wanted a story taken down. It was about Karen McDougal. David Pecker wanted the $150,000 back. He wanted to get paid back. So Pecker comes over, it sounds like, to Cohen and Keith Davidson reaches out. So there's a lot going on in this exchange. Cohen continues. He says, David Pecker wanted to get paid back. I met him at his favorite Italian restaurant. He insisted he needed to get the money back and Mr. Trump told me I'll take care of it. So they were going to pay Pecker back. Now, did you have other worries, says the prosecutor? He says, yeah, Pecker was thinking about leaving AMI, which he ultimately did, and he had a bunch of files. And so I was nervous that maybe he was going to take the files and those would hurt Trump. Did you tape a conversation that you had with Mr. Trump about Karen McDougal? Cohen says, I did. And I did it. How come? I did it to show David Pecker that Mr. Trump was going to pay him back. I put my phone on voice memo and I walked into Mr. Trump's office. Was Mr. Trump aware that you were recording? No, he wasn't. Prosecutor says, okay, ladies and gentlemen, let's play the audio of September 6, 2016. Says, who's on this audio? He says, that's me. That's Mr. Trump. There's Ron Graf on there. We started talking about a property in Charleston. And then we also started talking about divorce matters. And so they play the audio clip for the jury. And we're going to listen to that same clip here today. And this is what the jurors heard in New York. What, we should get rid of this because it's so false what they're saying. It's such bullshit. This goes away quickly. I think what, on the I phone. think it's probably better. Do the Charleston thing. In two weeks, it's fine. I think right now it's it's better. You know? Okay, honey. You take care of yourself. Thanks, Pam. Yep. I'm proud of you. So long. Bye. What's up, Mike? Great poll, by the way. Yeah. Seen it. Great poll. Making progress. Big time. And you guys are good guys. Oh, yeah. Pastor Scott. I can't believe it. No, what's happening? Oh, no. no can we use him anymore? Oh, yeah. hundred. No, you're talking about Mark Burns. He, we told him well, to... I, I don't mean that. Uh, Mark Burns, can we use him no. anymore? No. Richard Ugh. Lefkowitz just called. He just had we have a chance. He had an idea for you. So we got served from the New York Times. I told you this. We were regarding oh, to unseal the divorce papers with Ivana. We're fighting it. Kasowitz is going we to should never be able to get that. Done. Never, never. Kasowitz doesn't. They'll ever be able. They don't have a. Give me a coke, please. They don't have a legitimate purpose. And you so have a, a woman that doesn't want to unseal. Correct. So, so you've been handling yes, it. Yes, and it's well, all been going for, a while. for about two, three weeks now. All you have to do is delay it for... Even so. after that, it's not going to ever be open. There's no purpose for it. I told you about Charleston. I need to open up a company for the transfer of all of that info regarding our friend David, you know, so yeah. that I'm going to do that right away. I've actually come up and, I've spoken, me, and I've spoken to Alan Weisselberg about how to set the whole thing up with so what are we gonna funding. Do? Yes, and all the stuff, because, you know, you never know where that company, no, you never you know where he's going to be. Gets it, but Correct. So I'm all over that. And I spoke to Alan about it when it comes time for the financing, which will be... Listen, uh, what financing? We'll have to pay you. So I'll pay okay. no, 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 no. I got... No, no, no. Hey, no, how are you? Okay, so you heard that, right? So there was a weird edit at the very end. So he's talking, no, 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 no. Then a call comes in, and I don't think it's a call unless it sort of buffers the end of the audio recording and then just butts them up to each other. I think you'd have a natural break in there anyways. So that's the call. That is the recording from Michael Cohen. Still wild to me that he recorded his client and then I guess was going to share that attorney-client privilege conduct with another person who is not his client. So that's what he said. Now, that got played to the jury, right? Trump says, it's such BS, man. Ridiculous. Great call. Big time. Cohen. I spoke to Alan about it. Why open a company? So they play the audio. Then it's cut. Prosecutor picks back up. Mr. Cohen, why on that call did you say you needed to open up a company? He says, we needed to have separation. We needed to keep it away from Trump so that it's not in his name. And what did all this different stuff mean? What were you talking about? All the stuff. What did all the stuff mean when you said all the 
stuff. That was Pecker's drawer. And Mr. Trump said that he wanted to pay in cash. Is that right? He says, yes. They take their morning break. So again, that phone call could be about any David, could be about any LLC, could be about any business. It sounds like it's a perfectly justified business expense. It's Trump's lawyer who ran it through the CFO, who then's talking to Trump about it. Whatever the deal is, however they pay it with cash, finance, whatever. So it's through a CFO and through a lawyer. Trump is saying, yeah, just handle it. So they take their break. We're back. Michael Cohen's still on the stand. Judge Mercon says, you know, I usually tell the jury that the tape is the evidence and that the transcript is not the evidence. Todd Blanche says, yeah, we'd like that, Your Honor. Now would make sense so that they can hear what Cohen said and how ridiculous this whole thing is. The transcript probably reads worse than that little exchange was. So Todd Blanche says, perfect. Tell the jury that. No problem. They bring the witness back. Cohen's back on the stand. Jury comes in. Jury entering. We're all standing and we're seated. Judge Mercon says, welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. All right, we just finished with hearing the tape from the government. So I'm going to tell you that the tape is in evidence. You'll also get a transcript that also goes into evidence with you, but that is just an aid. So refer to the tape itself. The transcript is just an aid. Michael Cohen, welcome back after the break. Now the recording that we just heard, it got cut off. Did you hear that? Yeah. Can you tell me whose voice was that, that came in and cut off the voice memo? He says, that was my voice. I received an incoming phone call. He says, but your recording stopped. So why'd you take the phone call if it came in? So I had enough. I got enough of what I needed. So that's why I accepted the call. It just cut off your recording. I had everything I needed. Mr. Cohen, have you reviewed this AT&T record showing an incoming call to 0114 when the recording cut off? Yeah. Was the call from Capital One Bank? He says, yeah. Was there a longer conversation after? He says, yes. I mean, no, there wasn't. So there wasn't a longer conversation after the phone call came in. No, there wasn't. Mr. Cohen, did you ever alter this recording? No. You said you talked to Alan Weisselberg, the CFO. What did he say to you when you were talking about this? He told me that paying with a check from a Trump entity would defeat the purpose of keeping it separate, so create a separate entity. Mr. Cohen, what's this item? He says this is a signal message from somebody called Dan Rothstein. It's a signal message, like a text message. What company did you set up, Mr. Cohen? He says, I called it Resolution Associates LLC. And did you intend to yourself buy the McDougal life rights, the, her story? He says, no, I was doing it for the benefit of Mr. Trump. Did Resolution pay? No, they didn't. How come? Well, the cover of Men's Health with Karen McDougal on it made more money than they thought, so they didn't need the money from us. See, you put her on the cover, it's like, you know, a bunch of magazines will fly off the shelves. So they said, okay, we put her on Men's Health, so rip up the assignment of rights contract, so we don't actually have to pay any money because we sold a bunch of magazines, you know. What did Mr. Trump say? He said, great, we don't have to pay the money. Mr. Cohen, where were you when the Access Hollywood tape was released? We remember this one, the Grab Them by the Purse tape. I was in London. I was there for my daughter's 21st birthday, says Michael Cohen, and my anniversary as well. Did you get an email from Steve Bannon? He says, yes, I did. And Jason Miller got one too. And these text messages came in. Who are these text messages with? He says, well, these are between me and Chris Cuomo, who was back over at CNN at the time. And I told Chris Cuomo that I had request to do media when I got back from London. He said, no, nah, that's going to be too late. He says, I'm dying right now. Who is he? Cohen said, Donald Trump. So Cuomo was saying, Trump's dying right now. We need to get you on. He's getting killed. Access Hollywood came out. We need to hear your story. Trump is dying right now. Now, what's this message? Cohen says, that's an email about an old radar story talking about Trump being a playboy man, whatever. It's an email. And what did you do with this conversation? Well, I got Dylan Howard to have it taken down. AMI owned radar. And so I told Mr. Trump so he'd give me credit, right? There's this old bad story about Trump being this playboy going around doing all the Trumpy things. And so they got the story taken down. Did you have a conversation with Mr. Trump about Stormy Daniels, Mr. Cohen? Yes, we did. What'd you say? Well, I relayed what Dylan Howard had said. Dylan Howard, of course, from National Enquirer AMI. I told him, I said, we need to take care of this. Trump said, absolutely, do it. And what did he tell you about what happened in 2006 with Stormy? So remember the golf tournament where they met a long time ago, Stormy also wants her career to now come back and blossom after she's you know done her business. And she wants to be on The Apprentice. So she comes after Trump. They asked Cohen, what did Trump tell you about when he met Stormy Daniels in 2006? And they bring him this story. Is this legit, Trump? What do you want to do about it? He said, I was playing golf with Big Ben and I met Stormy and that she liked Mr. Trump over Big Ben. Mr. Cohen, did you ask Trump if they had sex? He says, I did, which is a disgusting, weird thing to ask your boss. Did he answer directly? No. Well, what did he say? He said that she was beautiful and he's his lawyer too. So maybe he's investigating. Well, did you do the thing or did not? Maybe he's the type of attorney who's like, tell me everything.
thing. Tell me the details. What kind of position? You know, he's weirdo. What did he say? She said she was beautiful. That's all. Did you speak to Life and Style in In Touch magazine, Mr. Cohen? He says, yeah. The In Touch magazine article did not come out. I spoke to Mr. Trump and I credited Keith Davidson with clearing up that story. Government says. Now, jumping forward to 2016. So they apparently met at a golf tournament 2006. Had you heard any more about Stormy Daniels all the way up in 2016? He says, no, nothing, Cohen. Did you learn if anyone else was representing Stormy Daniels, Mr. Cohen? He says, yes, it was Keith Davidson. Great. Now I want to show you some of these texts. Look at these. What does this one describe? He says, I said we'd use Resolution Trust to help facilitate these transactions. And in this text message, Dylan Howard from AMI wrote to me and he wrote to Keith Schiller or Keith Davidson, the lawyer, and connecting us about a business opportunity. That's right. What was the business opportunity between basically Stormy's lawyer and Dylan Howard? Well, Cohen says it was the acquisition of Stormy's rights, the life rights to the story of Stormy Daniels. Mr. Trump was angry, said he thought he had it done already. And what did Trump say about the Stormy Daniels story anyways? He said, you know, men might think it's cool, but women are going to hate me. So he told me. Trump said, get control over it. Did you two discuss the strategy? Trump told me to work with David Pecker and to get it done. He said, push it out past the election. If I win, it's not a problem. And if I lose, I don't care. I asked how things would go with Melania. Cohen says, I asked him, what's Melania going to think, Trump? He said, don't worry. How long do you think I'd be on the market for? Not long. This was all about the campaign. This is Michael Cohen. And that man, you're overselling it, Cohen. Come on. You're chewing the scenery, man. Knock it off. He's like, it's all about the campaign 100%. He said, I don't care about Melania. He said, I hate Melania. He didn't even remember who she was. Melania, who? What? Oh yeah, my wife. It, this is ridiculous. Mr. Trump told me, he says, I don't care if I lose. And if I win, it's not going to be a problem because I'm going to be the president. And so Cohen is so concerned. Not only is he asking about, specifically about sex. Did you have sex with her? Well, what's your wife going to think about that? He said, don't worry. How long do you think I'd be on the market for? Like he's going to divorce Melania. She's going to leave him. It's going to cause this massive divorce. And he's just going to get remarried. That is a dumb statement. Okay. Trump is not that idiotic. Michael Cohen is way overselling this. Trump understands the value of a marriage and what a marriage brings to the brand and everything that they've built. It's not Trump just nukes Melania and slots some other horse face in there. Okay. It's not how this works. This is a very, very power couple in many ways. It's not just like that. Trump's not just being flippant with that. Okay. Even if he doesn't love her or whatever, as Cohen is sort of implying here, which I don't think that's true at all. And we have other witnesses who confirm that. Madeline Westerhout, who testified last week, confirmed the same thing. Trump would tell them to call Melania when he was going to be late. Sorry, baby. I'm going to be late. Don't get mad at me. Yeah, I'm the president, but I know you're still my wife. So, you know, don't get mad at me. They all said that. Madeline said that. Hope Hicks said that she had tremendous love for her and was very concerned about it. This is just fake language. It doesn't even make any sense logically. So Cohen says it. He's overacting in court. Government says, well, what's this? This is about the side letter agreement, says Cohen. Also, they list who else had been told about the story. And so my instructions were to just, you know, push it past the election. And what was Keith Davidson complaining about? The lawyer for Stormy and McDougal. Well, I said I needed 10 days and Davidson was upset. He's like, get it done faster. Why do you need 10 days? Pick up the pace and so on. We're now at lunchtime. And so we'll continue on. And we're back. Judge Mercon says, can we get the witness in here, please? Let's go. Trump is asking animatedly to Todd Blanche. Todd is still in the lead counsel chair at the defense table on Trump's right. Trump is talking to them. Just flipping all out all over the place. Cohen comes back to the stand. Judge says, get the jury, please. And we're back. Prosecutor continues and asks a question. Says, this item is on the screen, Mr. Cohen. Prosecutor says, what is your reply to Keith Davidson here? Well, I told him that the office was closed for Yom Kippur. I was trying to delay until after the election when it wouldn't matter anymore. And what was Mr. Trump doing? He was campaigning on his private plane at the time. And then what happened next, Michael Cohen? I emailed Gary Farr he was at First Republic Bank and I sent him corporate documents for Resolution Consultants, LLC. And why'd you do that? Well, in the event of a need for an account or to transfer the funds, I thought we needed to send this back over to him. And what did you say Resolution Consultants was for? I said business consulting on marketing. It's why I created this account or this company. All of his clients are in the US. And what was your NAICS code? N-I-A-C-S code. He says this was about management consulting, including HR and marketing. And Mr. 
Mr. Cohen, was that truthful when you created this LLC? No. And so why did you change the name? You changed it from Resolution Consultants. Well, he says, Resolution Consulting was the name of the company of a friend of mine out of state. So I didn't want to use his name. He already got that name. So I switched it to Essential Consulting LLC. And what's this email? He says, well, Keith Davidson, the lawyer, he wrote, he said, if no funds come in today, the settlement contract is over. And then he wrote, my client considers it void ab initio. So void from the very beginning. Everything since its inception is now problematic. We were losing control, they said. Dylan Howard told me that Stormy Daniels was going with the Daily Mail. Oh no, everything's going to get leaked. And then Dylan Howard told me, you know, if I don't get paid, we're going with someone else. He told me that Keith Davidson had stopped taking his calls. So Dylan Howard from AMI is trying to call Keith. Are you going with Daily Mail? Are you going to take this story out? Oh no. Michael, did you call Mr. Trump at the time? He says, I did. I tried to tell him that due to my failure to wire the funds, she was going to the Daily Mail. I did. I told him. I called him. But the call only lasted eight seconds. Is that right, Mr. Cohen? He says, I received a voicemail. Oh, sorry. I left a voicemail. Then I canceled Resolution LLC and I set up Essential Consultants LLC. And then what happened next? Cohen says, Melania sent me a text. It says, call DT, call Donald Trump. And I did. So it went right to voicemail, it sounds like. Did you go on CNN's Wolf Blitzer? Yes. I issued a denial and explanations that I'd never seen him in that matter. I had talking points for the campaign. The Daily Mail was in play. What happened next, Mr. Cohen? Mr. Trump told me smart individuals told him to pay the $130,000. Mr. Trump told me other smart people told him pay the money. He told me go talk to Weisselberg. I did. And Alan asked, why can't AMI pay for it? They already did with McDougal. I told him they wouldn't. Well, why not use one of the golf courses to pay it? But they're Trump courses. So we couldn't figure out what to do. So I had to go create my own LLC. Did you ask Mr. Weisselberg if he would pay it? Objection. Overruled. Well, he said that he'd consider it, but he said I had four children in prep school and summer camps. And so Weisselberg said he wouldn't do it. So I did it. Mr. Trump told me, he said, don't worry, you'll get it back. Mr. Cohen, is this a list of your phone calls? Yeah. Are these calls you made with Alan Weisselberg? He says, yeah, all of those calls had to do with Stormy Daniels. And there was significant urgency in those calls. At First Republic, I had a HELOC on my apartment. I'd figured I'd use that instead of our bank account because I didn't want to use my bank account because my wife would have asked about it. So the dude is now hiding stuff from his wife to go save Trump. He's doing everything he can possibly do, I guess, to go save Trump. Wife doesn't know, breaching attorney client privilege, all to save Trump. Interesting. Now, did you have a call with Dylan Howard and David Pecker, Mr. Cohen? He says, yeah, I did. I asked Mr. Pecker if he would do it. He said, not a chance. He hasn't been repaid the 150, even though that turned out. It could cost me my job. So I did it, says Cohen. I just went and did it. Do you recognize this KYC form, Mr. Cohen? It's a know your customer form. He says, yeah, I do. It says Essential Consultants is a real estate related company. Was that true or false when you signed that, when you filled that out? That was false. And what's this? I forwarded this to First Republic's transfer to Keith. I sent them, here's the money, and money's coming over. And what's this? He said, well, that's a message from Dylan Howard from AMI. He laid out the terms of the deal. He said, I want payment by Thursday. And that is the wire transfer and the authorization. And what does the stated purpose on this transfer say? It says retained, says Michael Cohen. Is that truthful? He says, no, it was not truthful. It was not a retainer, says Michael Cohen. It was for life rights to the story, damages of 1 million per violation. Now, did you tell Mr. Trump that you did this? He says, yes, I did. I wanted to take credit for it because this was important. So I told him, did Mr. Trump sign this agreement anywhere? He says, no, I did. And who is ID'd as David Dennison in the side letter? Okay, David Dennison is a pseudonym, apparently for Trump. He says that was Donald Trump. And on November 4th, 2016, Mr. Cohen, did the Wall Street Journal publish a story about AMI paying off McDougal? Yeah. Did they mention Stormy Daniels in there? Yeah. He says, I discussed it. When that story came out, I talked about it with Hope Hicks. We just talked about blaming Clinton. Did you express any anger towards Keith Davidson, the lawyer who was representing both Stormy and McDougal? Yeah, I did. I told him Mr. Trump would be very upset with him. Objection sustained. Did you speak with Dylan Howard, Mr. Cohen? Yes, I did. And did Keith Schiller text you to ask if you could speak in 30 minutes? He says, yeah, I did. Did you talk to him? Yeah. Then I spoke with Mr. Trump for five minutes and 55 seconds, and he was very angry. The judge says, we'll take a break there, but we fast forward and we're back. Mr. Cohen, what are these November 5th, 2016 texts? What do these say? He says, well, in those, I told Hope Hicks, Trump's communication advisors, I said, I only see six stories and all of them are getting little to no traction. So whatever. She replied, keep praying. And did Mr. Trump ultimately win the election? Yes, he did. And after he won, Mr. Cohen, were you offered the role 
role of assistant general counsel? Yes, I was. But you were not offered the chief of staff, were you? I was not. And it bothered me that I wasn't considered. That's right, chief of staff or attorney general. So I pitched to be the personal attorney to the president. You know, that would open doors. And so Cohen looks over at the jurors. Companies wanted to understand President Trump, you know, and they would pay me for that. Did you tell your family about this? He says, yeah. What are these? Those are text messages with my daughter. Government says we moved to admit 258. My daughter was at UPenn at the time, and I told her the opportunities would be hybrid. I says I could monetize my access. What a piece of work, huh? Did you get the position as special lawyer to the president? He says, yes, I did. Did you usually get bonuses in December? He says, yes. Rana gave it to me, and I was very angry. He cut my bonus by two thirds, and he still hadn't repaid me the $130,000 when I got it in December. And it was just insulting. And I used expletives to Mr. Weisselberg. I said, F and A and F and A. I was even for myself unusually angry. Weisselberg said, hey, take it easy. I told David Pecker too, and he was mad. Did Mr. Trump call you? Yes. And did you then meet with Weisselberg about the repayment of the 130? Yes. And I showed him the first Republic Bank documents to Weisselberg. And I wrote on it. Plus the 50 grand paid to Red Finch for tech services on another matter. And Mr. Weisselberg told me, he said, gross it up. I'll gross it up since I'd be taking it as income. And did he pay Red Finch? He says, no, I paid them. Now I know the CEO of Red Finch. He said he brought the IP addresses. I needed him for other things I was working on as well. That's interesting. So it's a commingled thing. So there was also Red Finch in there. So it's commingled and Red Finch may not even be necessary for the stormy work at all. IP addresses for what? There were also 60,000 in additional bonuses for other things. So it was 420,000 total. Okay. So it wasn't just a stormy payment. It was for a bunch of stuff bundled in together. Bonuses, Red Finch, and other items. We went to Mr. Trump's office and there, Mr. Weisselberg said, we'll pay you monthly, like a legal payment, because that's exactly what it was. Since I'd be the special attorney to Trump, the payments would start in February. And did Mr. Trump approve it? Yes. He said it was going to be a wild ride in DC. Did Mr. Trump give you the job in that meeting or around then? He says, well, one or the other, I can't remember. I wrote to Gene Friedman. I told him, I said, I will be personal counsel to President Trump. And did you announce that new position on Hannity on January 18th? Cohen says, yeah, I did. Mr. Weisselberg said, I should send out a monthly invoice for legal services. As Trump's new lawyer, I did not prepare a retainer agreement because I knew that there would be no compensation. And so we're going to be coming back, of course, with more direct exam from Michael Cohen. Trump came out right after the fact. And here is what Trump said, speaking after the day was over. We'll listen to a quick second of this and then hear what you have to say about it. Is it just to show up they view this as a scam? I think it's a terrible thing that's happening to democracy in this country. And uh, we have a lot of them that want to come. I say just stay back and pass lots of laws to stop things like this. Uh, J.D. Vance, uh, what's going on in that courtroom is a threat to democracy. And we cannot have a country where we get to prosecute your political opponent instead of persuading voters. A.G. Byrd, as you know, very highly respected from Iowa. Let the American people decide who the next leader of the free world will be. Politics has absolutely no place in this courtroom. This is all politics. Andy McCarthy, great legal analyst, said none of this is illegal. It's called politics. There's nothing illegal. A lot of people say that. They're all saying that. The only person who won't say it is the judge because it's a rigged deal. He's conflicted. You better check that out. But everybody's saying there's no crime. Leo Terrell, up until right now, there's not a single shred of evidence that President Trump participated in a crime of either falsifying records or hiding a campaign or state or federal finance charge. None of it. There's been absolutely nothing. Look, they're doing great. You know why they're doing great? They've kept me here for three and a half, four weeks instead of campaigning. And yet we still have the best poll numbers just came out in the New York Times. Yeah, they're crushing. We talked about that on our members only stream this morning. Trump is doing very well in the polls and the Democrats are so freaked out. They don't really know what to do about it. They may be trying to indict him again in Arizona or elsewhere, but he'll be back on the stand for day 17. We're going to be here continuing to cover that. We'll see if we get into cross-examination in the time tomorrow, but if not, of course, we'll come back on Thursday when they take a break on Wednesday. They'll be back on Thursday to wrap up with Cohen, but we'll be
be here continuing to cover this, my friends. So thank you for subscribing and joining us as we do. Would love it if you joined us by hitting that subscribe button, inviting a friend or family member to come over and join us. We also do members only streams in the mornings. So whether you join us on locals at watchingthewatchers.locals.com or on YouTube, because we talk about a bunch of other stuff that we can't get into here, including the election, including some Biden stuff and other things. So come join us. We'll look forward to seeing you over there and back here on the next one. Oh,